Uh, John, if we were to go way, way back, your first ever memory of kicking around the football, what do you think of? Probably think of an O'Neill's football, uh, Gaelic football, to be honest. Um, but my first kind of schoolboy soccer team would have been Greenwood. Um, one of the lads that was living in my park at the time played for them, uh, the local club. Um, so I went down training, I think I was about five or six, and I did, there was no team my age, so I just joined in with the group above. And I was actually in goal for the first couple of games, but I kept trying to run the ball out my feet, so they ended up putting me out the field, I think. They put me as a striker, but then I slowly moved my way back uh, as the years went on. But yeah, my first memories are over in Coffey's Field in Toker playing for Greenwood. Yeah, he played in every position, I'd say, with Greenwood, you know, because there was one day he was half injured and he stood in bowls, another fella came out, they were sharp players. So every fella had to stay on the pitch, one leg or two legs. I think he was five or six. He used to play football himself and all, and he was always playing together. And he was called to the house. That's how I first met John. And then later on, when I fell in with Greenwood, I saw how good a player he was. <laughs> yeah, you could see he was good alright from an early age. Like he'd always stand out when you're playing either with him or against him. Like anyone was trying to avoid marking him, it was always I was given the job. I suppose we'd have our little bit of a little bit of a falling out, and then we'd be grand again in a couple of hours. When you think back to first influences as coaches, people that took you under the wing, that gave you the right bits of advice at the right time, who do you think of? My first ever Greenwood coach was Pat Holland. Um, he coached the, the year above me. Uh, he had two sons playing. Johnny Holland went on to play for Munster in, in rugby. He was one of his sons and we had a really good team. Um, we ended up winning under 11, I think, and under 12, won the under 12 Premier League in Cork and stuff. So we, we had a really good team. Um, but then my age, Ger McGreevy came in at about under 10s and he was a huge influence on me as well. Um, his son, Norm McGreevy, is still one of my best friends, plays Gaelic football with the Bears now. Um, but them two kind of early on, Pat and Pat and Joe were, were two huge influences on my on my football career. I remember watching them, they were under nine, was it under ten, under nine? And like there was a there was a lot of good players. There was a great selection of players. But John had that extra something you could see like either foot, great touch, strike a ball without grimacing. <laughs> he always had what it takes, like, in my view, uh, you know, all the way back then, even though he was only 10. John's a quiet lad, like, once he got settled into the team, we knew he had a good, good, good boot on him, you know. Both feet, not a bottle on him. And his, his greatest asset was that he could, he could read a game, like reading a book. On the pitch, John was like a chess player to me. He wrote two moves ahead of everybody else. So he read passes before sometimes the ball was even passed. So even from a young age, he read the game extremely well. He was, as I said to a scout one day, when he was doubting John's ability, I said, John is 10 yards ahead before he even moves of everybody else. And that's, I often asked his advice at halftime, so John might be the way. And I, I was happy to take it, you know what I'm saying? Because I knew he knew the game better than I did. Like. Tell us about the National Cup final. We went on a run, um, ended up beating St. Kevin's, Merview, a team from Monaghan, I think, Carrick Rovers. And then we had a local derby with Corinthians in the semi-final over in Toker. And the place was absolutely packed. You know, I'll never forget it. I was only 16 years of age at the time. Um, but to the atmosphere of that game still, you know, I still get shivers thinking about it. There's a big bridge behind the goal in Coffey's Field. And, Went to a penalty shootout and the whole bridge was like covered. Um, I'll never forget it. So getting to the final then and actually beating Saul Till, our goalkeeper Damien Cahillan plays uh, hurling for Cork now. He actually scored with a long punt upfield. Uh, kicked Keeper the ball scored. Of, kicked the wall and into the pitch. Yeah. Wow. Um, and it bounced and the, I think it just took their keeper by surprise. Skidded, bounced over the keeper. He got a hand to it. And down we go again. Conor Murray is up and okay. Good ball inside, good ball to the keeper, yes, yes, yes! Oh! Um, and it went in, so... Damien, our hero, Damo, the keeper, best goal ever. And I saw him come off his line and, uh, you know, had a punt off it. And, uh, look, ended up getting a goal and complete fluke. Just one of those things, it was wind assisted, 
hopped on the 18 yard line and the poor keeper wasn't having the best of days and hopped in over his head. But Damien, did he tell you he just gave away a penalty before that? We were one up and Damien gave away a penalty. It's in the mouth of the Greenwood people. He gets a lovely cross in, it's coming right over, but watch it. Oh, Bob and Ed. And referee wants a penalty. Oh, underneath his body it goes and into the back of the net. And he equalised. But then he scored about three or four minutes later. When Damo got that goal, with goal, you know, we just said, this is it. It has to be our day. So fair play to him. He caught them napping. He caught the goal while Ed's napping. That was their World Cup. Big time. Big time. I think that put us 2-1 up and then we sealed it 3-1 in the end. But, you know, the celebrations after that was, was unbelievable. Um, it's the first time we ever won the National Cup in my club. And, you know, for Greenwood, that was huge. And, you know, it's... Uh, it's one of the most memorable days of my life. You were playing Kennedy Cup, so you're obviously at a good level at a young age. What age are you when you start thinking, you know, maybe, maybe I'm at that very top level where I could go, go across channel? I suppose I didn't think too much about it until the Kennedy Cup. And then after the Kennedy Cup, a few of the lads were getting trials and stuff, and I didn't know too much about the whole trial system and that. Um, I didn't get any trials out of the Kennedy Cup, but I felt you know, from playing at that level, I felt like, you know, maybe in a year or two something might happen. Um, and then I was due to, I think I played in the Galway Cup with the Irish team, on the Irish Emerging Talent team under 14 or 15. Um, and from there, from that tournament, I started getting trials. Um, I went to Sunderland for a week, loved it. And then kind of halfway through that week, I kind of had, you know, had an inkling that, you know, they might be interested in me. So then they pulled me into the office and they kind of said, look, we're interested in signing you. Um, that was kind of the first conversation I had with them. And then from the Galway Cup, I ended up going to Leicester, Blackburn, Chelsea on trial. So I was thinking, you know, I might have a chance of, of getting a contract somewhere. But I still didn't think about it too much because I was just living in the moment. Um, you know, still playing McGreenwood, still playing Gaelic, still playing Hurling. Um, but then a couple of, you know, a couple of contract offers come through um, and that's when it kind of hit home, you know. I remember him telling us at the time and obviously as your, you know, your best friend growing up, like you're sad that he's going away but you're absolutely delighted for him that he's getting to to live his dream like and, and kind of go and try, and try and make a living for himself over there. But when he went, like, for real, I screamed for two weeks. I thought someone had come off my hand. You know, it was the most heartbreaking thing ever that had happened in my life up to then. I literally screamed for two weeks until I could scream no more. You know, my dad had great belief in me, so everything he kind of said to me was always positive. Like he, you know, he'd say to me, look, believe in yourself, I believe in you. If, if I didn't believe in you, I'd tell you not to go. Um, you know, he just said, go over there, work as hard as you can. And, you know, I believe that you know, you'll do well, so. And you believed him when he was telling you that? Exactly, yeah, and that made me believe in myself. Yeah, his dad was brilliant with us, to be fair, like, he, he's, I suppose, all of us are just sport mad, like, and John was sport mad as well. Just being out the farm with him, John, he was, he always wanted us to be, like, better and do better and do extras and do more, like. He used to bring me and my buddies, we used to, he used to bring us out to, we call it the farm, it's a um, training ground out near where Cork City train uh, in Bishopstown. So he used to bring us out there with hurlies, footballs, uh, soccer balls, everything, tennis rackets, golf clubs. So we used to go out there for the days uh, and he was kind of our coach really. I remember one day we were out, we were actually down Coffee Field and there's a small little bit of a hill there. And John, like his dad would have been older and like we were just tipping around and his dad was there just doing like hill sprints up the hill and just, it was really funny. But he was a good man as well for advice and stuff for games. Like again, like with John, he's never too high, never too low, but he was a legend of a man to be fair, yeah. Yeah, they all missed him actually. All the boys were very sad that time because he was like, you know, he was their friend and yet he was John's dad, if you know what I mean. Now it took John a while and to this day he misses his dad, he'd love, you know, he often mentions it now like, which dad was wrong for this. People in this country know all about your father and how brilliant a footballer he was and all the success that he had. If you were asked by a, a teammate who knew nothing about him but heard he was a famous sports person in Ireland, how would you describe him? My father? Yeah. Um, I'd describe him as 
very intelligent, um, witty, loves a joke and supremely talented. Um, and I suppose he was a good guy as well. <laughs> but he was, uh, no, he was, he was really kind of warm. Um, he'd warmed everyone. Uh, I think even, you know, I'd be, a lot of my friends would kind of, you know, have really close relationships with him. And I think now when I'm older, you know, to look back and see the relationships he had with all my friends, you know, I meet people on the street and they always tell me stories about him. You know, he talked to anyone. He'd, he was obviously a superstar in his era in Gaelic football. And, you know, growing up, he, I'd see him chatting to different people and he always made time for everyone. Um, but he was, he was very intelligent as well. Um, you know, he kind of knew what to say at the right time. And whenever we went kicking ball with him, he was, you know, he was head and shoulders above all of us. He was probably 40, 50 years of age and he was, you know, <laughs> pinging him over left, right and center, uh, making a show of us. But um, I suppose the, the best trade he had was his, you know, he, he was a very warm person. He could talk to anyone. Um, he'd make everyone feel really special. And, you know, that's probably what, I, what I'm most fond of him for. I see, at the start you'd have goosebumps and you'd be this way and you'd be sad that your dad was missing it or my dad who was mad into sport got resting as well. I can say this myself, what he deserved because he always believed in himself and he always put in the hard work and he just was aiming all the time that this is what I want next, you know, if he's lucky enough to be called up and it happened. Thank God for him. Oh, it's incredible. Um, you know, I was at Brentford at the time and I, I got the phone call and you know, all of a sudden, you know, you just think the green jersey, you think, you know, the Aviva, you think of all the all the legends who've worn the, the Ireland jersey and, you know, even regardless of whether I played or not that first camp, you know, I was just so happy to, to be here. Um, you know, I came in to see legends, you know, right, like John O'Shea and everyone around the, you know, the, the hotel and stuff and it was a bit surreal, um, you know, but at the same time you wanted to kind of come and, you know, do well for yourself. but. Yeah, to, to get the call up and to see your name in, in the Irish squad was, you know, one of the one of the most one of the best feelings ever. We went over to see him one time when he was playing with Brentford, and it was my first time I'd say seeing him over there. And I couldn't believe how good he was. Uh, he was playing centre half, like he didn't miss a pass, and like, it looked like he didn't break sweat. And I was I was actually in awe of him. I said, Jesus Christ, did I train him to do all that? No. <laughs> But I glanced behind me, you know, and who was there? I mean, Martin O'Neill, who was Irish manager at the time, and he wasn't picking John. So Owen was with me, I said, Owen, John's after uh, doing his chances of playing for Ireland. No good, I said. I said, what do you mean? I said, Martin O'Neill's behind you there. He said, but John is having a storm, huh? I said, that's what I'm saying, I said. He doesn't want a footballer, eh? He was always a great footballer, eh? But that, that was the time I kind of stood up and said, Jesus, what a player. I thought John should have made the Irish squad a lot earlier, in my opinion. And I'm not an expert now, and I don't know what but I thought he was overlooked being from such a small club and not coming from the bigger clubs. And I thought maybe he was overlooked for that reason, because that happens in small clubs. And but I knew once he got his chance that he would make it his own, you know. Um, so the fact that he's consistently on the Irish, uh, Irish team and has captained him as well, um, I'm delighted for John, you know, and it's, it's great, great to see him. And um, where they are, Chelsea, it's fantastic. The first goal, then, uh, the goal against Portugal, you talk about your mother, she's there right behind the goal. Like, that's as long as you live, I'd imagine it's a moment you'll never forget. Yeah, it was funny because I think at the time there was only Portuguese fans allowed in, but I think my sister managed to get tickets the morning of the game um, on one of them websites. So um, they kind of half wore Ireland colours and half wore Portuguese colours to get in. She really got the goal. I forgot where I was having bananas. And I scored the goal. I didn't know where they were in the stadium. Um, and, you know, I scored the goal, literally, literally just ran into the corner and just seeing them out of the corner of my eye, just seeing my mum with her hands up. And it was, that was another surreal moment. Uh, but yeah, that was probably one of the best feelings I've ever had in a football pitch. Um, obviously, it's good in that we lost the game, but that feeling to go 1-0 up and to, to see them there, um, just randomly was, was unbelievable. <laughs> uh, was she in tears in the stand or she just lost it completely? No, I think she was just lost. Um, she was absolutely buzzing. Uh, there was loads of Portuguese fans around them and you know they were just up there with their hands up and you know, I seen her straight away. Uh, I, was meant to, I was running to Jamie because Jamie took the corner and then I just looked into the crowd 
I think I, gave, I, think I did that to, to kind of shush the crowd and then I seen my mum <laughs> and I was just like, just got lost, it, caught up in it. They were looking at me, God, we thought she was Portuguese, but now we know she's not like. Maureen mortified down about two metres from me. I say, would she ever sit down? But sure, I couldn't. No, she loves it. Um, you know, she loves sport in general and, you know, the, the fact that I'm playing football for, you know, Sheffield United and, and Ireland, she's, she's really proud and she doesn't miss an Ireland game. Um, you know, she's been to everyone so far at the Aviva, so uh, yeah, it's, it's great for her and, you know, it's good. Gives her something to look forward to. But she loves watching the games, um, you know, when I play for Ireland, you know, it's the proudest she... I don't think I've ever seen her any prouder every time I see her in the Aviva or if, if she's ever had an Ireland game or watched an Ireland game. You know, she's a proud Irish woman. Um, you know, it means everything to her that I'm playing for Ireland and for me to see that in her um, is, you know, really special because we're all proud to be Irish but when you kind of, when you see how proud your parents, well obviously my mum is, when I'm playing for Ireland it makes it that more special. Um, she gets very emotional around the Ireland games as well, uh, which is funny but, you know, it's uh, means the world to her and you know, I'm just lucky that I'm able to, to give her that.